Hi, everyone. I'm the, the co-founder of Stellar.org. Um, I'm going to talk about creating the internet for payments. Um, today, payments are actually pretty broken. And this might not seem obvious, because on your cell phone, you can pay for your car and your hotel, and it all seems pretty easy. But if you look a little bit, if you dig a little deeper and try to do a little more, there's still some pretty big fundamental problems. And let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so imagine this man here, Tavi, that maybe lives in Atlanta and wants to send money back to his family in Thailand. But he can only afford to send 20 bucks at a time back. Uh, and so, but in order to do this, his bank will charge him more than that to send the money. So obviously, it's not really possible. And even if his bank did charge a, a reasonable amount, then uh, his mother doesn't have a bank account. And so on her end, she, it would involve, like getting the money for her to actually get the money would involve other people and other, more time and more expense. Um, and another example is imagine uh, a factory in, in China that needs to supply an oil refinery in Nigeria. And in order for this factory to get paid, the, the, the money will take over a week to, to reach them. right? And so this has all kinds of repercussions for the factory because it limits the amount of productivity they can, they can uh, it, it limits how productive they can be because you know, they in turn have, have suppliers. And, and so it limits their cash flow. And this is 2016. You would think that all of these things would be a lot smoother. Um, so let me, let's, look, let's talk a little bit about how payments work now. So if we're in the same room and I want to pay you, it's very simple. I can just hand you $20, uh, and it's instant and free, and it's very easy. Um, if we're at the same institution, it's also pretty simple. My account is debited. Your account is credited. The money moves. Um, it gets a little more complicated when, we have, uh, when we're at different institutions. Maybe they're not on the same payment network. Uh, maybe they don't have a relationship with each other, so the money has to flow through some corresponding institution in the middle. And this, this causes more delays and, and more friction. Uh, it's even more complicated when uh, I want to send one currency and you want to receive another. Um, and in that case, sometimes it must be converted in the middle to some third currency. In, in the, the Nigeria to China example, it goes through dollars in the middle, uh, which neither party really wants to hold. And, and so it's subject to currency volatility. And it's an even greater issue if, one of, if there's a failure in the middle and the, and the transaction has to be rolled back, right? Um, so yeah, payments today work largely like the internet hasn't been invented. There's all these different payment networks. There's Swift. There's ACH. Um, you know, there's mobile money things like M-Pesa and Bcash. Uh, things like Venmo, and none of them interoperate, right? And so this is kind of the fundamental problem and why uh, it's still slow and expensive to send money cross-border, and there's uh, this uh, burdensome compliance process that still leaves banks exposed to a lot of risk. So is there a way to fix all of this? Uh, you know, maybe there's not. There's lots of different currencies in the world, and maybe sending money cross-border is always going to be a little bit uh, full of friction. Um, but before we give up, let's look at this nice analogy to email, right? So in the early days of computing, uh, if we were on the same mainframe and I wanted to send you a message, it was pretty straightforward. I would just leave the message, and when you logged on, you would get it. Um, it, it was still pretty easy when we were on the same network. Um, there was a simple protocol to send it from my machine to your machine if we were on the, on the same local area network. Uh, it started to get a little more complicated when there were different networks. Maybe we were on different operating systems. You would actually have to specify the route through, uh, through, from computer to computer to reach someone else's machine. And then if one of those machines was down in the middle, your email would get lost. Uh, it, was, it was sort of this big mess. Like no one, no one knew if the mail would get there or not. And this all was all changed when some, in 1982 when someone came up with what's called uh, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or SMTP. And SMTP is this uh, open, interoperable standard that anyone can adopt, right? And so the beauty of it is now uh, people who run mail servers, for instance, like Gmail or Yahoo, they don't have to have formal relationships with each other, right? They don't, they don't even really have to know about each other. The, the protocol, they just have to adopt the protocol, and then the mails can flow, right? Um, and what we've seen is SNTP and, and email has grown extremely rapidly since it was introduced, introduced. It's had huge benefits for our society and economy. And it's all because SNTP provides this open protocol for communications, right? So why can't we use the same model for payments? Like, that's kind of what we want, right? Um, so it turns out sending, sending a payment is a little more complicated than sending an email. Uh, when you send a payment, when you send an email, it, I can send someone the exact same email and it's not a big deal. But if I send you $10, I better not be able to send the exact same, or someone else the exact same $10, otherwise we have a problem. And this is known as the double spend problem. And it's sort of a subset of this first point here. How do you store, proof possession, and transmit value in this digital way? Um, and so then the other problem is, how do you digitally represent existing currencies and assets? Because you know there's people all over the world, and they use different currencies. And these things, everybody wants to use what they, what they use locally, right? We want to use dollars here. In Mexico, they would use pesos, et cetera, et cetera. And then once there are these different uh, currencies and assets, how do you make them interoperable, right? Um, you know, w when you're sending a payment to someone in Mexico, it shouldn't matter that it has to do some currency exchange. It should still be uh, frictionless and, and quick, right? 
And then importantly, once, uh, once you make this system, you need to make sure it still scales. Like it needs to be used by billions of people, millions of transactions. So is it even possible to solve these problems? And in fact, uh, we didn't think, uh, computer scientists didn't think it was possible to solve the first one. You know, how to solve this double spin problem wasn't even known until recently, uh, until one of these visionary Satoshis gave us Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin, Bitcoin is this awesome uh, innovation, right? It does these kind of two things in this elegant way. Um, the first thing it does is converts a real world resource, i.e. electricity, into a digital asset. So it takes uh, something in the real world and turn, puts it into the digital realm, right? And the second thing it does is it provides this immutable public record, right? Uh, it, it's, it's basically, there's a database there that everyone can see, uh, but no one can change arbitrarily, right? So it's as if there's this giant rock out there on the internet that you can now chisel things into. So in the other example, if I want to send you $10, now I can just go chisel into the, into the rock that I've sent you $10. And so if I try to send it to somebody else, then they'll see that it's already on the rock and, and can't be done, right? So that's great. Bitcoin solves the double spin problem, right? So it solves the first issue on our list here. But we still have these three remaining challenges. So how do we solve them? And then you might first think, well, maybe we'll just kind of keep adding stuff to Bitcoin until we get there. But, but that's not really the way software works. You kind of want to have... Uh, the, the design from the beginning and just solve these simple issues, right? So, so Bitcoin was designed to be a new currency. It wasn't really designed to be this unifying universal payment network. So that's what Stellar does. It solves these three remaining issues. So I'll just kind of walk you through how we do that. So, so the second problem is how do we digitally represent uh, existing currencies and assets, right? So what that means is uh, if you have a, a digital dollar in this network, you want to eventually be able to take it and redeem it for an actual dollar, right? So somebody, somewhere out there in the world, there, there needs to be a physical dollar that's backing this digital dollar. So there needs to be cash in vaults somewhere. And, and luckily, we already have institutions that do this, and they're, and they're called banks, right? So Stellar, we have this concept called anchors, and all an anchor does is it takes a uh, a dollar or any, any kind of currency that's represented in the traditional uh, payments networks now and puts them into the Stellar network, right? So it goes from uh, existing network or existing fiat to digital realm, right? Um, so that's great. That solves the, the second problem. Now the third problem is how do you make these things interoperable, right? So if I have digital dollars but you want to receive digital pesos, how can we do this uh, exchange, right? So. Stellar uh, is, is just a digital database, so you can put other information in it, right? So one of the things we put in there are offers to buy or sell these different, different currencies, right? So you can put up offers to, you know, for instance, here, you know, buy some, some Naira and sell some Yuan, right? And then when somebody wants to send money from Nigeria to China, they go through your offer, right? So uh, the, the, when they go to make the payment, uh, atomically it'll look, for, it, it'll, it'll look for what's the best rate in the order book and take that payment and, or take that order. And so you'll, you'll basically be selling your Naira to someone in the middle who will, who will be giving you on to the person on the other side. And this whole thing happens atomically and within just a few seconds, right? Um, and the fourth problem is how do you make sure the system still scales? So one of the ways that we do this is with the Stellar Consensus Protocol. And all of these blockchain type technologies have an underlying consensus protocol. And the consensus protocol is how the network agrees upon what what is on that big rock, right? Um, so SCP, it doesn't use uh, proof of work. It has a, so it has a few different properties, right? So it doesn't require like a room full of machines to validate the network. Um, it's all just simple ma message passing between the participants. Um, it, it has really low latency. It's three to five seconds to confirm a transaction. Um, it has this flexible trust model where you choose who in the network that you're willing to, to listen to and, and participate with. Um, the kind of the nitty gritty details of, of the algorithm are kind of beyond this talk. Uh, if you're interested, we have a, a good video by Professor David Mazarius who wrote this white paper uh, about how it all works. Um, so again, what we wanted to achieve here was a, a universal payment network that it would, doesn't matter if your financial institution is a bank, a mobile money operator, if, if you're holding one currency and, and the person wants to receive another, all of these systems should be interoperable. And so that's what Stellar is. It's, it's a, an uh, open protocol for payments. So that's great. So we kind of technically solve these problems. There, there's, there's still some, you know, again, what we're running to do is, is connect all these different financial institutions together. So we need a way to uh, have a common addressing scheme between, between participants, right? So we came up with a scheme called payment addresses. It's very similar to email addresses, obviously. And what it allows you to do is rather than um, you know, give your bank account number to somebody because that's like this clumsy system and you know, it's actually not safe, you, instead you can give this kind of human readable payment address and it's much easier to deal with. Um, so here's kind of an example of that in practice. So here's this bank's hypothetical mobile wallet uh, where their customer wants to send to their friend Chang in China. So they enter in Chang's payment address, changstarwechat.com. 
uh, they're given this exchange rate. If they accept it, a couple of seconds later, the euros are deducted from their account and Chang has, has yuan in his account. And there's some market maker person in the middle that now is holding, euro, or holding more euro and less yuan, right? Um, so Stellar is, the Stellar network is much bigger than Stellar.org uh, where I work. Uh, it, it's, it's a collection of, it's a whole ecosystem of companies that, that are kind of coming together to make this possible. Here's a few examples of, of the people that are, that are working with us. There's a lot more that are um, still not ready to announce, but uh, will be coming out soon. Um, so the, the implications of some network like Stellar are pretty broad, right? So what we're essentially creating is an internet for payments, right? So much like the internet democratized information, or democratized access to and the, the creation of information, um, Stellar will, will provide not only financial inclusion, but, but a uh, economic participation for all these, uh, for anyone in the world, right? It opens it up much wider. So you can imagine like some kid in a basement in Indonesia can now make an app and sell it to anyone on the world for a dollar, which is just simply not possible right now. And so it's, it's, uh, it has a lot of uh, ramifications. It should be pretty cool, right? So um, I often am asked like, will technologies like Stellar or Bitcoin or any of these emerging things, will, will, they, like, will they destroy banks or are they, or are they gonna like, displace these existing payment networks, things like this? Um, I don't think so. I think there, there's always going to be uh, a place for banks. I mean, people want to put their money somewhere. Uh, people need loans, things like this. Like, banks serve a, a useful function. But I do think um, what, what, like, the internet and what things like Stellar do is they give you a lot of leverage and they give you a lot of scale. So I think we'll see a similar phenomenon to, for instance, there used to be very many booksellers, but now there's just Amazon, right? There used to be a lot of taxi services, now there's just Uber. There used to, there's now lots of banks and different payment networks in the world, but now in the future, there will probably be a great deal of consolidation. And so this is uh, a big, exciting opportunity for people who kind of adopt this technology early and uh, get on board. Um, so, and what's also interesting is that when you look at, you think of the creators of the internet, they didn't anticipate things like Airbnb and Wikipedia and all these really uh, interesting innovations that came along once, they were, once people were given this open platform for innovation, which was the internet. And I think similarly with, with Stellar, like we anticipate some, some pretty obvious use cases, but I think what people ultimately develop for, with it will, be, uh, will surprise us. And so we look forward to seeing what you build. Um, and that's it. So if, you know, I'm happy to answer questions, and if you have others offline, you can please email us, but yeah.